But I'm going to be talking today about uh, unsustainable consumption and the advent of new values and lifestyles and in the transition to by the end we're going to be talking a little bit about this idea of post-consumerism and try to provide for you some evidence that we're beginning incipiently to make a transition from, cons from a consumerist system of social organization to a post-consumerist system of social organization. So I work in the field of sustainable consumption, which uh, at least in the United States or in North America more generally, is really about studying unsustainable consumption because we have not yet reached the point in this country where we've been able to give rise to a, a, a policy program that, uh, that, uh, that gives credence to um, movement, systematic movement towards, uh, towards sustainable consumption. Um, and I, I find it useful, and this is the point that was referenced in the introduction, to make the distinction between weak and strong sustainability, which some of you may have come across um, in the past. Um, for those of us working in the field of sustainable consumption, we kind of have an analogous notion where we make a distinction between weak sustainable consumption, which uh, is, uh, is anchored in initiatives like eco-labeling, consumer information, consumer education. It tends to be very voluntaristic appeals to ideas about consuming differently, uh, emphasis is on institutional procurement rather than on households. Uh, it's tantamount to what we've come to understand these days as green consumerism, energy efficiency, materials recycling, by local campaigns, the kinds of things that many of us are very familiar with and have become increasingly so over the last couple of years. By comparison, um, there is greater attention being devoted um, um, uh, to the notion of strong sustainable consumption that adopts a much more macroeconomic uh, perspective um, and indeed focuses our attention on the political economy uh, and the boundary conditions in which our consumerist lives take place within. Um, it's about looking at the unsustainability of con uh, contemporary social practices, consumption of energy, food, mobility, these, uh, uh, these domains are embedded in complex socio-technical systems. It's multi-scalar and emphasizes the importance of multi-scalar evidence, uh, governance to reduce the overall quantity of resource throughput. Uh, and it recognizes the need to foster global scale strategies consistent with, uh, in one way or another, referred to as by the idea of contraction and convergence. I've been over the last uh, year um, working quite closely with the Chinese Environment Ministry on a task force that's been convened under the auspices of a multilateral organization called the China Council for International Cooperation on Development. Um, and uh, I've had the opportunity to, um, to try to educate the Chinese government on issues related to sustainable consumption. And this experience has, in a very real sense, prompted me to think about the experience in the United States um, through, if you will, kind of a Chinese lens. And that's a little bit of what I'm going to talk about here today. So first of all, it's useful to make the distinction, to make the recognition that in the United States, 71% of the American economy, economy is comprised on what we do in our consumerist lives. Seven out of ten dollars uh, that contributes to gross domestic product, we heard a little bit about this this morning, comes out of our pockets. By comparison, China, uh, has a consumer society that is less than half of what we have here in the United States. Um, the total J Chinese economy is comprised only of 35% um, of, uh, of activities carried out by individual consumers. There is going on, and you may have heard of some of this over the last couple of years, there is an epochal shift taking place in China where China is now in the process of shifting from export production or having an economic dependency on export production to becoming more economically dependent on domestic consumption and domestic consumerism. So part of the work that I'm involved in is to try to encourage the Chinese from going down the road of replicating the experience that we've had in this country over the last uh, several decades. It's also an interesting moment because China is giving birth to an effervescent consumer society while at the same time here in the United States our own consumer society seems to be showing its age. Um, the standard narrative that we tend to tell ourselves is that 
the achievement, the triumph of consumer society in the United States uh, is the result of entrepreneurial tenacity as implemented by folks like this in combination with the insatiability of American consumer demand and then leavened with a healthy dose of advertising. The point I'd like to make here this afternoon is that we really do live in a consumer society. I think the prevailing social tendency is to use this trope of a consumer society in rather pejorative terms. We use it as a way of kind of making fun of ourselves, poking fun of ourselves, and saying, um, yes, we do live in a consumer society as a form of kind of self-deprecation. Um, what I try to do is to uh, invoke the concept of a consumer society in a much more rigorous, analytic way. And one way to do so is to start off with a definition that a consumer society uh, is a community in which the buying and selling of mass-produced goods and services is promoted through mass media and is the dominant economic activity. We can think about societies that have an organizational logic premised on agricultural production. We can think about societies that have a logic that's premised on industrial production. And we can think about societies like our own that are very much organized around a social and cultural logic premised on consumption and consumerism. To give this idea of a consumer society more analytic edge, I invoke a series of concepts, well-known concepts, within social, economic, and political theory, the idea of disembedding, and I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by that, the notion of atomization, uh, pseudo-individualization, um, commodification, and marketization. So the transition that we've experienced over the last couple of hundred years from the kinds of societal organization that we heard about this morning to where we are today is the result of the very successful achievement of each one of these processes. Disembedding, which is a concept that some of you may associate with the social theorist Anthony Giddens, it's also associated with another social theorist by the name of Mark Granovanter, refers to how contemporary social practices are no longer primarily defined by their grounding in local context. Social practices become stretched over time and space and become guided by impersonal and abstract factors. Again, the sort of idea that we heard in a slightly different um, context being talked about this morning. Consumer society is also characterized by atomization, the reduction of pre-existing collectivity or community into smaller and distinct units. Pseudo-individualization, the phenomenon by which false needs and differentiations are created and satisfied to give an impression of individualized expression. Commodification, the transformation of goods and services as well as ideas or other entities that normally may not be considered goods into commodities. And finally, the notion of marketization, the actor process of entering into, participating in or introducing a free market economy for the transaction of goods and services. These processes have played out in the period since the end of World War II in the United States against a particular demographic background a particular economic background, political background, and a background informed by availability, the widespread availability of natural resources and an environment that was readily available for the externalization of the costs of consumerism. So the period since 1945 in the United States has been characterized by the, um, uh, by the birth of the baby boomers and the subsequent um, movement of this cohort through the life course in subsequent decades. Economics, we've seen a situation of rising median household income. I mean, these are factors on which the consumer society um, has thrived um, and likely would not exist and certainly would not exist in the form that we've come to associate it in the absence of these kinds of, um, of, um, of drivers. 
We also had a bipartisan political consensus, whether you were Republican or Democrat, that economic growth and more consumption was a good thing. And finally, we had a situation where there was ample availability of natural resources in order to provide the raw material for our consumptive lifestyles. Now, there's also a kind of myth that exists that the consumer society has come about as the result of the natural functioning of the market and the ability of producers to meet the demands of, uh, uh, the ability of producers to meet the demands of consumers. Um, I think what's cut out of that narrative is that, um, that in fact there has been a tremendous amount of government or state activism in the creation of our consumer society, beginning with the introduction of Social Security during the 1930s, which had a profound effect in shifting propensities to save in favor of propensities to consume. This is precisely the process we see taking place in China today, and it's following in very much in the example set forth by the United States several decades ago. The introduction of government guaranteed mortgages has also served as a very important underpinning of contemporary American consumer society. The availability of the mortgage interest deduction, a perquisite that many of us benefit um, generously from, and the, and the construction of the interstate highway system as a means of enabling the creation of a suburban landscape which has served as the, the crucible, if you will, for our consumptive lifestyles. So once you have the house, you then need to fill it. So the point here is that it's taken a tremendous amount of political work to create and then to continually maintain the policy infrastructure that supports our consumer society. Another thought I'd like to sort of introduce here is to whether we're now beginning to see a reversal. In other words, whether we're losing our will and losing our capacity to continue to do the heavy lifting that's required to maintain that infrastructure. Or, as I sometimes um, refer to this point, is can a consumer society persist in the absence of a middle class? Because we see a process of demographic aging occurring in the United States. Um, as the baby boomers move through the life course, their consumption practices and patterns are changing quite radically. Within the next couple of years, we will have a population profile in the United States where 20% of the population will be over 65 years of age. Another underpinning of the consumer society that we see shifting and eroding and changing is the fact that the proceeds of economic growth are coming to be very disproportionately distributed. So there was a time during the 1950s and 1960s where economic growth was broadly beneficial. That's not the case any longer that our current uh, system of economic and political organization has created circumstances where the proceeds of economic growth are wildly disproportionately accruing into the hands of those at the uppermost reaches of the income distribution. And as many of you know, we are now living through a period of time where income inequality in this case, measured by uh, something that demographers call a Gini coefficient, is now reaching proportions that we haven't seen since the 1920s. And that the United States now has the dubious distinction of being one of the, country, being one of the, 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 the OECD countries with the most unequal income distribution. I mean, how can this not have profound implications 
on our consumer society. Economic growth is becoming more and more difficult to achieve. In the 1960s and 1970s, 4% economic growth on an annual basis was ordinary. Um, today, we consider ourselves quite fortunate if we're able to eke out 2%. So the pie isn't growing, and it's not, well, it's certainly not growing as fast as we're accustomed to. And we're also going through a period of profound political dysfunction where this um, consensus that previously existed around the desirability of economic growth is fraying. We're locked into this kind of politics of austerity where we think, or at least some people think, that we can somehow grow our way um, out of our problems by reducing the amount of public expenditure being uh, spent on public investment and other um, uh, public needs. We're also facing a situation of increasing scarcity. I don't want to get into a debate here today about whether we're facing peak oil or not. Uh, the situation, particularly here in the United States, has changed very dramatically in a very short period of time. Um, because of the opening up of, uh, of, of new sources of oil, the advent of, uh, of hydraulic fracturing. Um, but what certainly is non-debatable is the fact that the United States is facing a global supply situation where it is no longer able to dictate terms of trade in the same way that it previously had been able to do so. This slide here shows the fact that China and other developing Asian nations now consume more oil on an annual basis than we do in the United States. We also seem to be moving to a situation in the United States where on one hand we have a relative, relatively select number of people who are able to participate in what I like to refer to as boutique consumerism. This is sort of consumption of the 1%. Well, the vast majority of the American population is relegated to engage in survival consumerism. This is consumption that is um, um, based on a much more subsistence level of existence uh, and um, um, is, uh, um, is shaped by very, very precarious economic um, circumstances. In the minds of many, the United States is standing in the precipice of replicating the situation that has existed in Japan over the last 30 years. I mean, for most people, this is the nightmare scenario, that the United States follows in the footsteps laid down by Japan of economic contraction, of a reduction in savings, of, um, of, uh, of, of, um, of deflation, um, and a spiral that just becomes increasingly difficult to break out of. I'm not so sure the situation in Japan is as grim as many American economists and financial observers like to paint it. There's considerable speculation that Japan is in the vanguard of a transition from consumerism to post-consumerism. And there's also some evidence beginning to accumulate that the United States is beginning to follow in the wake of the pattern already established by Japan. I'd like to look at a couple of the mainstays of the post-World War II consumer economy or consumer society, namely the suburban house and the family car and the changes that we see taking place within those two consumptive domains. Home ownership rates in the United States are now at the lowest level that they have been in in almost 20 years. Some of this is the fallout of, uh, of the financial crisis and the, uh, the ongoing recession, but there's also some fundamental shifts occurring in Americans' conceptions of the desirability of home ownership. Especially among members of the so-called millennial generation, generation wires, we see substantial reductions in um, uh, propensity to own a home. This slide here is showing the reduction that's occurred in a relatively short period of time in the home ownership rate among Americans under the age of 35. So if you want to look for changes, you want to look for where the, uh, the precursors of societal evolution are occurring, 
It's the generation of, of, of millennials that provides a very important and useful place to begin to um, embark upon that examination. There's also been some fundamental changes that have occurred in the idea of a mortgage in the United States. There was a time, and some of you may recall yourselves or may recall from generations gone by, that families would do anything they possibly could in order to maintain their currency on a mortgage. Regardless of what the adversity was, regardless of what the family circumstances were, maintaining a mortgage was, a, was seen as a, uh, a measure of personal pride. We look at it today, according to uh, some recent data I was able to get my hands on, almost 50% of the American population, or uh, the homeowning population, would walk away from their mortgage if their house was underwater. In other words, if they owed more on their mortgage than the house itself was worth. Among men, that figure was almost 60%. It becomes very difficult for the banking industry to maintain the availability of 30-year fixed-rate mortgages when you have this kind of sentiment that requires active policing and litigation to ensure that people stay current on their mortgage. The foundations of this kind of, of financial tool have been very much dependent on the willingness of mortgage holders to maintain their own commitment to the integrity of that financing. We also see some very important changes taking place in and around the car. I pose it in terms of the question here, is it the beginning of the end of the road of the car? Transportation planners have begun to talk about the fact that we've reached the moment of peak car. That in the United States, vehicle miles traveled per year are declining, vehicle trips are declining, and it's not only in the United States where we see this phenomenon occurring, it's also happening across the whole range of affluent or post-affluent societies um, internationally. And interestingly, um, this is data on the, uh, oops, sorry, this is data on the percentage of 16 to 24 year olds that have driver's licenses. That there's decreasing interest on the part of teenagers and 20-somethings in participating in that rite of passage of getting a driver's license. Now for many of us in this room, turning 17 or 16 or whatever the age of driving was, was a major milestone in life. 17-year-olds in the United States, it's barely above 50% of them have driver's licenses. And we can speculate at some length as to reasons that are prompting that shift. But the point is, is that the automobile industry, and I spent some time a couple of years ago reading consulting reports produced by the likes of McKinsey and so forth for the automobile industry. Um, the automobile industry is fearful not only of their inability to sell cars to kids, but their inability to sell the idea of an automobile-oriented and independent lifestyle to kids. There's also tremendous, and we heard a little bit about it earlier this morning, there's also a tremendous amount of social innovation occurring. I think many of us tend to think that innovation is something that occurs within a scientific laboratory, or innovation is something that, uh, that design engineers pursue. Uh, but innovation is also a social activity in terms of how we constitute and organize our own lifestyles. And what we see taking place is a growing appreciation, not just for buying local or shopping at your local farmer's market, but in, the, in, in constituting one's lifestyle around localism as a fundamental organizing principle. We also see the rediscovery of a term that was originally introduced in the 1970s by the likes of Alvin Toffler and Daniel Bell, 
namely prosuming, that the integration of our lives as producers and our lives as consumers becoming more singularly unified. Many of us have grown accustomed to being passive consumers, reliant on someone else to produce the material abundance upon which our lives are based. But that distinction is now becoming less and less useful as prosumption becomes more um, 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 in evidence in our lifestyle. We see the advent of peer-to-peer -peer and collaborative consumption provisioning networks of all manner taking hold. And I suspect that a number of you in the room here today participate in some of these kinds of activities. What we see taking place is the separation of ownership from usership. Many of us have grown accustomed to the idea that to use a good means owning that good. And what we, the shift that we see taking place is a recognition that you can have access to goods without actually owning them yourself. We also see the advent of what some people have uh, referred to as unconsumption. In other words, lifestyles that are specifically predicated on the idea of delinking yourself from consumption markets and developing alternatives through self-provisioning, communal provisioning, barter and trade networks. Um, this isn't necessarily retreating to the, uh, to the chicken coop that we saw earlier, but it's a recognition that the acquisition of goods through cash purchase in the marketplace represents just one form of goods access, um, and that lifestyles are now being formulated that are predicated on a much more diverse array of alternatives for acquiring access. We also see all kinds of new business models percolating up. Um, the celebrated business strategist Michael Porter now talks about the creation of shared value between producers and consumers. Um, business models that are organized around the notion of how we can more effectively allocate excess capacity. I mean, so this is the Robin Chase model spearheaded by Zipcar. That most automobiles spend 96% of the day sitting unused at the curb or in your garage. How can we begin to use goods more intensively as a means of reducing the overall supply of those goods that are ultimately necessary to meet societal needs? We see the advent of bike sharing and sharing as a, um, as a, as a form of e social and economic organization. The stigmatization that was previously associated with the use of shared goods is collapsing. And we even see within the marketing profession the advent of what some people have begun to refer to as mindful consumption. That we're transitioning from the era of conspicuous consumption to an era of mindful consumption. So the last slide here is that uh, I sort of leave you with the question of whether we are indeed at the early stages of a transition to post-consumerism. Some of the things that I've pointed to, and you can probably highlight your own examples, uh, represent the incipient or nascent uh, transitional activity that are associated, that is associated with this transition. But we shouldn't fall into the trap of thinking that this process is going to be easy. That apocal transitions from agriculture to industry, from industry to consumerism, have been fitfully painful and have created all kinds of dislocation. And to think that we're going to be able to transition from consumerism to post-consumerism in a gradual, planned, uh, uh, um, um, effortless way, um, I don't think is, uh, is, uh, is really on the cards. Um, but what I do want to place into discussion is the extent to which you yourselves, 
feel or see the early transitional evidence of this movement away from consumerism to something that will ultimately come to replace it. So thank you very much.